trying to build this racetrack in an 11 month period, essentially quite a task in itself. So many people have worked so hard at this. What we're looking forward to the most is seeing the lights go out and cars on track. You know, when I got here, I think Steve Ross had a vision to make this a global entertainment destination. At the time, we had a 27, 28-year-old building and some acres with parking lots. You know, with this vision of creating a global entertainment destination, you start with Steve's commitment, his, his private, you know, multi, multi-million dollar investment into renovate the stadium and make it state-of-the-art, world-class, differentiated from other stadiums. If you start there just with the events we hold in the stadium, and then we had you know, a Clasico with Barcelona, you know, Real Madrid, got Dolphins games and Hurricane games. And then, you know, then in 2020, we have the Super Bowl, we have the National Championship game. But then to throw the Miami Open Tennis Tournament into it, to keep it here in Miami, which was really Steve's commitment and vision that made that happen. And to be able to create something that wasn't there in the parking lot. And then to bring in Formula One. Well, Steve likes big ideas, and this certainly was a big idea. I think the idea of bringing Formula One here resonated with Steve right away. I'm not sure he fully understood what it meant until we went to the Montreal race together in 2018. And then he got a little bit of like, whoa, baby, this is going to be a challenge. Like, I think the scale, the scope, it's a massive, like, undertaking to do this. So, But, you know, he's a guy that has a lot of belief and faith and confidence in the team that we have here and the things that we do. and. He's a great person and he's innovative and he's outside the box thinking and he's committed and he believed in the vision and, uh, and supported it the whole time. I think as far back as, you know, 2017, really, we, we started talking about putting Formula One here and, you know, Formula One being, you know, the, the greatest motorsports in the world. If we're going to try to do something here, we want to do the biggest, best, most global thing we could do. So. Uh, we, we talked to Formula One. Formula One was at the time had been acquired by Liberty Media and they were talking about wanting to put a race in Miami. And they were really dead set on putting it downtown. One of the people they had there as a consultant was Richard Cregan. And Richard had run a race team in Formula One, had propped up a couple races in Formula One, certainly was experienced. When we first started talking about downtown, I brought Richard back here and on the whiteboard, wrote on the whiteboard sort of, here's the positives and negatives of having it downtown. But here's another idea. What if we put it here at the stadium? And here's the positive and negatives of that, and wrote it on the whiteboard. And then took him around the stadium and showed him the spaces and gave him the vision for what it would be here. He got it right away. I think coming here and seeing the vision, you know, I took Chase Carey here to the stadium. We put cones out where the racetrack would go. Uh, we drove the cones, you know, on a golf cart. And I showed him this is, would be a real circuit and here's how it would work. Took him on top of the stadium, walked him around, showed him how this would be a rare thing where you could see almost the whole racetrack from up here if you walked around. So to put it here at Hard Rock Stadium gave us an opportunity to use the stadium, use the surrounding area, have a blank piece of paper to create the racetrack itself and try to create a track for great racing. About a year later, we convinced Formula One to put it here. And a couple years later, you know, from that, because it took some time going through the due diligence of the deal and then negotiating the deal and then the pandemic hit and that took a year. And then we finally got it done. Richard had a picture of the whiteboard still on his phone and reminded me about it. And uh, it was pretty rewarding, you know, that four years later, whatever it was, here's this whiteboard. And then here's the deal. We're doing it here at the stadium. Well, when we got the deal done, we got to Imola, and it was really exciting to be there. Unfortunately, it was during COVID, so there weren't any fans. It was difficult to get to Italy. There was one hotel to stay at. You know, it was a, it was a very challenging uh, trip just to get there. But once we got there, it was fun to be at such an historic track to announce, you know, the Miami Grand Prix. Uh, Chase Carey was there, who had been a big part of it, Greg Maffei from Liberty, and, of course, Stefano, who you know, really deserves a lot of credit for getting this done. I think Chase and I kind of started the process together and when Stefano came in, it was a pretty quick few Zoom calls. You know, we hit it off right away and we're able to hammer out a deal pretty quickly, even though it had taken a long time up to that point. So it was fun to be there with them and to be there with Stefano specifically and be able to sign the contract there and kind of celebrate 
and enjoy, you know, what was to come. We really had 12 months essentially to get this done, which presented a lot of challenges. You know, you've got a Dolphins football season you have to play, but you also had the Miami Open Tennis Tournament, you had a Rolling Loud Hip Hop Festival, you had several concerts, soccer matches, a college football semi-championship to play. We had, you know, a lot of events to work around that year to get the track built. So when we got back from Imola, it was just, let's go right away. I mean, we had to get started right away to get it done in time. The challenges were massive, and it starts with a plan, a schedule to build the racetrack itself around the events that we had in place. And how are we gonna park cars for football games? And how are we gonna have a tennis tournament when we have a racetrack going through the tennis center? Where was Rolling Loud gonna actually exist this year? We had to put a phase plan together of building the racetrack itself and start there. And then while we had that ongoing, then it was working on making decisions on the programmatic elements. The grandstands, the club spaces, the hospitality spaces, the luxury spaces, the garages, all of these things presented tremendous challenges, but again, you know, we have a great team. We're a fully operational sports and entertainment venue. Just focusing on Formula One is not an option for us. We've got to put it together while everything else is being built at the same time. And building the track itself is much more than people look at it and say, oh, you're just kind of repaving that area of the parking lots or whatever. We had to dig down several feet, there's several layers of asphalt, there's drainage systems, there's elevation changes, you know, so it was a really quite an undertaking to try to build that racetrack. I think doing that in a post-pandemic world with supply chain challenges, if that was the only thing we were doing, 12 months was going to be a short timeline. But doing it in 12 months with all these other events we had to put on and doing it around that was a real challenge. So a lift is technically a layer of asphalt. Each time we lay a layer of asphalt, we have to give a minimum of at least 10 days to two weeks of cure period. So incorporating that timeline into everything else that we have going on on campus, we knew there were gonna be challenges. What I would tell you we didn't know is the complexity of those challenges with all the other events that are happening on this campus. So over the last couple of months, as the track has begun to take shape, every time that there's another event, Every time that there's a track crossing, we have to get ahead of that. We have to lead time to make sure that the track isn't impacted by a truck or a golf cart or anything that's rolling over the racetrack itself. Tom Garfinkel had a very clear vision for what we wanted to do for this race and how we wanted it to be different. So he set out that vision from the very beginning and then it was on all of the teams to come together and bring that to life, making sure that we offered something other races haven't done in the past and challenge sort of the status quo of what Formula One means. And there's no greater city to do that in than Miami. What's always fueled my passion for, for my life has been this fusion of cultures. And I think that's why I like Miami so much. There's this amazing fusion of cultures in Miami. And I think that that's the model we want to live by. Miami is a dynamic, growing city. I think maybe the most dynamic city in the country right now. Miami's a melting pot. The cultures are all different. We're used to seeing that. We're used to making things gel and fit when they're not supposed to. And that's what this is. Miami for Formula One opened up a whole new audience as well. You know, Miami is a curator of culture, I like to say, and in a lot of ways, you're talking about fashion, art, music, certainly food and hospitality industry, sports. It's just a very growing, dynamic place to be right now. It's an exciting place to be. This track, 3.36 miles around the Hard Rock Stadium, home of the Miami Dolphins. It was a car park, it's now a brilliant racetrack. You know, we try to get a little creative here with some of these things and create some things that hadn't been done before. You know, the Yacht Club, the Beach Club, the Palm Club, like different areas and different experiences and almost create a Disneyland-like campus that people can go experience different things. What we're trying to hopefully create is something that feels a little bit different, that's reflective of Miami, that first and foremost has great racing. One of the biggest challenges was communicating a product that we didn't have yet. How do you communicate something when it's not built yet? And how do we manage expectations? Because that's really important too. We garnered so much excitement and energy. And so making sure that we deliver on that excitement, but also managing what to expect was the, one of the biggest challenges.
in many ways, we were flying the plane while we were building it, you know. Once people signed up and, and, and showed interest in, in this race, we took them along a, a journey to ultimately to either join us, you know, at the race or to watch it on TV. They signed up. We had a, a very a sophisticated sales team that reached out to them. Lots of visuals. We had a 3D rendering of every single seating product throughout the entire circuit. So if you wanted to sit in one place, we could show you a 3D view of that. Uh, so that you knew exactly what you were buying. And so just things like that, we, we tried to make the experience a good one for our customers. And so we knew that the demand was high. We've never done this before. And so we had to be really thoughtful in when we went on sale as far as getting people excited so that they would purchase tickets, but not over-promising something that we couldn't deliver on. So what's great about Formula One is just, you know, you have 90 million viewers watching every race, which for the most part is equivalent of a Super Bowl. So we wanted to find the right partners. We started with our current partners um, and wanted to see which of them wanted to jump on board and be part of this race. And so several of them, you know, stepped up. One was Hard Rock, uh, you know, the naming rights of our stadium, but they wanted to get on board immediately and be a partner because they, they're a global brand and they're an entertainment brand. And it just made sense their customer matches up nicely with the F1 customer. But also they wanted to bring entertainment and, and partner with us in the entertainment space. And so as you know, we have several artists that are coming out to the race to perform, whether it be the Chainsmokers or Post Malone or Tiesto. So they've been great partners. And then we also started to approach some partners that were already in kind of the racing world, the Formula One world, uh, that we thought made sense to jump on board with us for this race. So your Red Bulls of the world, your Heinekens, uh, they were excited to, to be part of this from the beginning. I can't tell you the number of issues that we've had and the number of uh, challenges we've had to overcome. Permanent structures and temporary structures and track builds. Almost 60,000 square feet of garage space. We have over 170 different tents that are going up. We have 10 different grandstands. We have 13 different hospitality structures. We have over seven miles of fencing and scrim that are in the process of being built. When all was said and done, we needed almost 12 million pounds of steel. It's just to get the steel ordered, to get it shipped here, to get it here on time, and then to actually start slinging the steel into making buildings out of it is a daily challenge. We're trying to do things that generally take three to four years in 11 months. When you're designing a track and you're designing you know, the runoff of a track that's very TV visible, it's really the most iconic parts of the track. So when, when we're walking in and, and we see a shadow being cast on the floor of a palm tree, and we're like, oh, well, that's beautiful, you know, that's, and it's something that it's, it's kind of cliche, but we're like, that's so Miami, it feels Miami. And um, when we started putting that up, and I mean, we've, we had like, I would say 20 or 30 different renderings of the, uh, of the runoff. And that's the one that everybody just zeroed in on because it just felt so natural. It wasn't overdone and it just looked beautiful. I think in order to make the F1 experience fit in with the stadium, we took a lot of design and color cues from the stadium itself. You know, all the seats are all aqua. Our signage predominantly around the stadium is aqua. And I would say whenever we could, we would also incorporate the stadium into the designs. Um, we, have, we had some t-shirts that incorporated the stadium into design. And the top of the trophy. There was a lot of discussion about football. Should it be a football related trophy? I didn't think so. Uh, but having something stadium related on there, we wanted to work with Tiffany to do it because they do the Vince Lombardi trophy in the NFL. We thought something that was, you know, Tiffany created similar but different, right? The creative team did a great job of taking the shadow of a palm tree on the ground and we used it for, you know, different parts of the racetrack. So that palm tree look became part of it. So they put that on the trophy and the stadium kind of sits on top of it. Formula One is the most technologically advanced sport on the planet. The telemetry data, the fiber optics that's required, it's massive. And we had 40,000 feet of cable that were put in just for the race systems. 
it's, it's a tremendous amount of data that you move. And then when you take the race out of it and you start thinking about all of the fan systems, we don't just think about what's here on property. We think of everything from when the fan leaves their home or their hotel to get onto the property. So we have to tell them what streets are shut down. What are the optimal ways to get here? We have a partnership with Waze, which is just fantastic. Once they get to their preferred parking, now they have to get on the shuttle. They have to make sure that they have you know, access into the building. We then have all digital ticketing. So the digital ticketing has to be enabled. We have to have enough capacity. We have to make sure no matter what carrier you're using, you can pull up those tickets. You can have a seamless ingress experience and get in. Uh, our ingress experience, we aim for less than five minutes. So security through, through ingress, you're in the door in five minutes. Um, from there, wayfinding. No one had ever been here before. No one knows what we have done with this, with this experience. So looking at every piece of that puzzle, mobile app, how can you look things up, you know, from, from how can I get from the beach over to the marina? We have to tell them all of those paths. We have to help them understand. After that, getting them into their experience, making sure that they can see all angles of the track. We partnered with Verizon to do multi-cams. F1 is feeding us 21 different camera angles, and then we're feeding seven different best camera angles to each fan that's here. We wanna make sure your cell phone works. We wanna make sure that you can pay in an agnostic manner. You wanna use Apple Pay for concessions, you go right ahead. We want the fan to have a choice with each and everything that they do, and we want them to enjoy the experience and not have to sit in the friction of the moment. This is big. I mean, there's there's art everywhere, and that's what's great about the Hard Rock Stadium and and the staff here. They've always incorporated art into everything that's that's going on. The international world is here. Let's present them to some additional Miami artists. And then basically, we went through the different sections that are like the West Lawn has the Miami Design District feel, so that's a little bit different of an art that would be in the Start and Finish Lounge that we're in right now. Every day, it's getting closer and closer and we're just, just not there. So many decisions to be made and so much still to get done. There are 103 concession stands, approximately 93 bars. There's 32 restaurants, 12 all-inclusive hospitality spaces. We have 14 of our local uh, minority-owned partners that are activating on site. So the challenge has been just the vast amount of communication that is needed with each one of those partners to logistically make them successful on site. Every day I've been at this track for four months as it's been built at the Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, so yeah, not a lot of sleep and uh, a lot of work. Well, Eventsource's role has been to design, engineer, and build temporary structures, including the Pit and Paddock, Paddock East, the Claren Race House, the Palms, and, and many others. What's special about this paddock in comparison to other paddocks is that this is a uh, true hybrid building. It's sitting on top and connected uh, properly to the pit structure and then connected to the stadium via a bridge. Some of the hurdles we overcame while building the paddock, probably the most difficult one was to build at the same time the pit was being built. So between the construction company building the pit and us building on top of them, which literally happened that way, you can imagine the integration of, of those two teams and everything that has to come together is, is difficult. It was a dance with them, uh, but we both got it done and uh, here we are. Basically a month into my role, I was asked uh, to figure out the largest yacht that could be transported on land to, to get here. That kind of started me down the path and put me in this yacht guy role.
In terms of logistics and transportation, I'll tell you it's a 10 month process. One of the biggest things that I learned was apparently the COVID led to a boom in the boating industry and so everybody's buying up boats. So it made it extremely difficult to source them. Um, there, there were times where we didn't, we're at 10 right now and there were times where we thought we'd have half that number. I think there were times where we thought we might not even have any just based on the responses we were getting. Moving a 65 foot yacht, it, it took the group five hours to get here. Some of the other boats, they get here in, in an hour. You've got to identify a transportation vendor that you can trust, that, that knows what they're doing, that's capable, has the equipment, has the staffing. It, that's not necessarily somebody you just find just anywhere. Then it's reaching out and working with a, a marina. Um, that has the capabilities of removing the boat from the water and staging it and working on it because all of these boats, in order to move, you've got to remove parts um, off the top and off the bottom in order to fit it on the trailer and, and to make it street legal in terms of height. And so that takes time and it takes uh, locations and it takes space just to be able to do it. You know, the interesting thing is we kind of turned off the marketing and, you know, PR uh, and it was deliberate in nature. You know, I think everyone was excited to come to Miami first and foremost. When we showed them the vision of what this could be, what we hoped it would be, what we planned to create, uh, they got really excited and it kind of became a word of mouth thing and it became a, what do you see Miami? And it almost became, well, what are we going to see? What's it going to be? And, and we held it back and held it back and held it back. And I think it almost created more dialogue around this event and then when we did share it recently uh, the reaction was like wow you know it's more than we expected so hopefully they come to the race and we deliver on on that vision and people come away saying wow that's that's more than we expected and that was different and that was great and i can't wait to come next year one of the experiences we added um, kind of as we got closer to today was this idea of a campus pass so What's unique about our circuit and Hard Rock Stadium and having the race here is we have this beautiful stadium that we could take advantage of. And so we created this campus pass that a fan could purchase. They don't actually have a seat, but they could walk throughout the entire campus and go see the, the MSC Cruises Yacht Club or the Hard Rock Beach Club. Or they could walk in Hard Rock Stadium up on our 300 level, which is normally for football games, and look down on the racetrack and, and experience that. So. The Campus Pass ended up being a really popular uh, experience for, for a lot of fans. There's a lot of emails probably going in my inbox right now that I won't get to till tonight, but I think really it's understanding the, the vision the client wants and making sure we deliver that. We made a promise to them to deliver such, and that's really what keeps us up at night because we want to make sure that A, the spectator has a great time, that's the main priority, but also that we deliver what was promised. The next 20 something days, whatever the countdown is, pretty much it's going to consist of a lot of long shifts, 22 to 24 hour shifts. Uh, crews working around the clock, everything's planned right down to the minute, to the hour, to ensure that suppliers continue staying on schedule and staying on track. So then we're ready to receive the FIA and F1 on May 1st, once they start moving into the structures and getting ready to actually have a race. This event is so different than anything that's ever happened at Hard Rock before because it's the biggest event we've ever done by far. I mean, it, it could not get bigger than what we've got right here. We're to every corner of this campus and it's just been so fun to see it come to fruition and really be a team with everybody we work with and kind of just all come together and go, how do we make this work?
you look at Miami Guards, you look at the F1 race in general, it's something that they didn't have a lot of knowledge about. It's more so, it's bigger than just the cars on the track. It's a different education opportunity. It's learning about STEM. It's learning about putting the cars together. It's learning about all the different jobs that kind of go on. There's all these careers that people in this community can have that they can be a part of and didn't know about it. So F1 can be that beacon of hope. And that's what's great about the F1 in Schools program. We're getting youth involved uh, earlier and they can go back and tell their parents and maybe, oh, I want to get better grades. I, not only do I want to be Lewis Hamilton, I do want to be Pierre Gasly. I want to be the driver. I want to be the person who puts together the cars. I want to be the engineer that designs all those things. So giving that inspiration and hope, that's the best thing that I've seen coming from this. And that's what I'm hopeful to see, that we have people from this community now working in STEM education and they're very inspired for this because being in a car at F1 and in schools. After this race, F1, I think is gonna be one of the bigger things in this community, if not the biggest. I think that the ability to have this type of event here in Miami, here at Miami Gardens, here at Hard Rock Stadium, it's gonna like change lives. I truly believe that in terms of what people can achieve, what they can become, whether they see the impact, the economic impact, and they see the educational opportunities, it's gonna be unlike anything that's ever been here before. I don't know that I could have predicted the growth of Formula One to the level it's at. I, I think certainly when we started looking at it, you know, 2018, 2017, you know, I knew what the sport was. I, I knew it was arguably the largest sport in the world. I think if you combine all the international soccer assets, it's bigger than Formula One. But if you just look at, at La Liga or EPL independently and compare it to Formula One, Formula One's the biggest sport in the world. You know, certainly the NFL is the biggest sport in the United States. So I knew what it was and I knew how important it was. And I knew that Liberty Media had bought it and had a vision and plans to change it and to grow it. They've certainly done a great job with that. But there's a lot of other things Liberty Media did to help grow the sport, not just here in the United States, but around the world. I mean, the sport right now is, is the biggest thing going, so we're just excited to have it here. And I think based on that, Steve's vision of a global entertainment destination has been achieved. Race day, when the lights go out, the cars take off, that first lap around the racetrack after everything everybody's gone through to get to this point and how hard the team has worked to do this, um, that'll be a special one. It's the first ever Miami Grand Prix. We're racing in the States and it's lights out, away we go. see the result of, of the first race and how people are talking about it and the, just the buzz, you know, it really, I think, is becoming probably one of the most important sporting events in America altogether. I think it will be. And everywhere I went, people have been talking about what a great time they had. It makes me feel very proud about our team that we have, but it's always about the team. When people are working together, you can accomplish so much more. And I think everybody was really enthused to do it they were uh, motivated and uh, they did a great job and I really applaud them.